Okay, we, we now call to order the uh, Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy. Let the record show that today is April 4th, 2024, 3.47. And we have five bills on our agenda today. Um, we want to start off at Senator Hao Chow. Senate file 4523, and let record also show that we have quorum. We're going to have a few member or couple member online as well. So, Senator House Chow, anytime you're ready. And while Senator House Chow is situated, I just want to announce to testifiers that. Uh, um, now, because we start a little late, we don't have ample time, so want to announce that each, mem each testifier trying to stay within two minutes range of your testimony. So, thank you very much, Senator Hao Chow. On to your bill. Thank you, Chair Her and members of the Environment Committee. Today, I have for your consideration Senate File 4523, which would create a critical minerals recovery advisory task force with the goal of ensuring Minnesota leads the way in recycling the materials we need to build a strong, clean future. Chair Her, I do have the A3 author's amendment. Um, is it A4? A4, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, the A4 amendment. Members, the A4 amendments is in your package. Um, any question on the amendment or Senator House Chow? Um, what should we just amend it and you can talk about the whole bill as amended? Okay. All right. M member, all in favor of the A4 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion prevail. Senator House Chow to the bill as amended. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill helps to build a strong circular economy in Minnesota by focusing on what we do with the materials once they've been collected and diverted from the waste streams. Currently, much of our collected recycling is exported to other states or countries for recovery after the dismantling and shedding, shredding phase of the process. This is especially true for materials containing critical minerals, which are most often processed internationally. These critical minerals are essential to a clean energy future, particularly for energy storage batteries, electric vehicle batteries, and wind and solar components. Processing and recycling these minerals here in Minnesota will keep them domestic, attracting new industries, creating resilient and localized supply chains, uh, growing jobs, and contribute to our clean energy goals. Because mineral demand is expected to double by, the, by 2040 under current climate uh, policy commitments, creating the Critical Minerals Recovery Task Force is a key piece in actualizing the recycling infrastructure we need here in Minnesota. Thank you, Chair Her and committee members, and I do have a couple of testifiers. All right. Uh, we have a, a number of t testifiers. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, two at a time and then ro rotate each chair if possible. Uh, first is Ab Ms. Abby um, Hornberger, and also I want to call John Arbogast um, from the United Steel Workers. Okay, welcome, Ms. Hornberger. Uh, state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. My name is Abby Hornberger. I'm the Minnesota Policy Organizer with the Blue Green Alliance. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 4523 today. As we all know, critical materials are essential to our clean energy transition. As you heard from Senator Hochschild, um, our expected mineral demand is expected to double over the next years um, to align with our local and global climate policy commitments. Minnesota is uniquely positioned to be an example of a truly circular economy if we invest in bringing recycling recovery infrastructure to the region. Establishing this task force would ensure that all stakeholders are brought along when developing a strategic roadmap for recovering minerals like lithium, copper, nickel, cobalt, and more. Bringing this infrastructure to Minnesota would create greater economic diversity and can provide high road jobs for workers in local communities, all while helping us achieve our climate and recycling goals. Today you will hear from our broad coalition of environmental groups and labor unions who agree it makes sense to invest in recycling in Minnesota. Your packets have letters of support from a wide variety of partners from the Sierra Club to Conservation Minnesota, Fresh Energy, the United Steelworkers, the Laborers Union, um, Recycling Electronics for Climate Action, as well as support from industry groups like Mining Minnesota and counties at the Solid Waste Administrators Association. Additionally, BGA's fact sheet includes, included in your packets holds information on the new and emerging technologies that are focused on 
um, reducing emissions associated with recovery. Building a clean energy future means ensuring that critical materials needed are obtained responsibly and support good paying family sustaining jobs. Senate File 4523 is the key to kickstarting necessary conversations and work to achieve a circular economy in Minnesota. Thank you for your time today and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Hornberg. Um, next to Sapphire, Mr. Arbogast, welcome. Thank and you, I'd like Mr. To Chairman. Call before, I'd like to call Mr. Slater to the table as well. So um, go ahead, Mr. Arbogast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Arbogast. I'm a staff representative with the United Steelworkers. I'm out of the Eveleth office. I represent the contracts and the members of the six Taconite mines in northern Minnesota and also have partnership agreements with Talon Tech and New Range. Um, thank you, Senator Hochschild, for this bill. The Steelworkers Union thanks you, the committee's hard work this session to protect Minnesota's environmental now and for the future generations. I'm here today in support of SF 4523, which would establish the Critical Materials Recovery Advisory Task Force. This task force will help create jobs and opportunities for workers in the state and help grow and sustain Minnesota's economy for years to come. Our union has a long advocated for decreasing our reliance on foreign countries for materials crucial to our supply chains that we would recover, recycle, or process here in Minnesota, the United States. In Minnesota alone, research has found there's over 266 million pounds of e-waste available for recycling every year, which would greatly decrease our country's reliance on foreign products if we're able to tap into this potential. It is essential to mine, recover, and recycle the critical materials our country needs domestically. Currently, China and the Democratic Republic of Congo are the two biggest providers of critical materials in the world. But they use unethical labor protect practices, child labor, no environmental standards, like forced to, to obtain these critical materials. The United States has some of the best labor and environmental standards in the world, which should be looked to as a model for advanced manufacturing. Our country needs to make various products that are obtained responsibly and continue to support good paying, family sustaining jobs in the future. Minnesota can lead the way by adopting policies like SF 4523. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Abagas. Um, I'd like to call Mr. James uh, Liner to the table and so Mr. Slattery, welcome. Go ahead, you. proceed with your testify. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Paul Slattery, and I am the Director of Politics and Organizing with the Teamsters Union Local 120. And I'm here today to speak in support of Senate File 4523. We represent 11,000 members across Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa, including a group of recently organized workers at Ridwell in St. Paul. Teamsters represent workers across the recycling supply chain, from collections, dismantling and processing, to organics waste. Teamsters are also industrial workers, representing Gopher Resources in Egan, Minnesota, processing lead batteries. However, we are missing a necessary domestic infrastructure to achieve a truly circular recycling model. And that is uh, industrial recovery infrastructure for critical materials like copper, lithium, palladium, and more. We need a high road operator who will care for the workers' health and safety while helping Minnesota achieve its clean energy recycling goals. End of life products like electronics pile up in our houses, which could be harnessed to help us meet our clean energy goals. Ridwell collects electronic waste from individual re residences like old phones, cords, screens, and other equipment that should, be not, that should not be thrown away. Worldwide, we generate around 40 millions of tons of electronic waste annually, and only about 12.5% of e-waste is recycled. Ridwell takes pride in processing their materials domestically, and we want to help achieve a high road domestic supply chain of recycled materials through and through. When we process and recover materials at home, we can have a greater impact on the labor and environmental standards operators are held to. We have the opportunity to create a truly circular economy in Minnesota, and the Teamsters want to be part of that story. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 4523. Thank you, Mr. Slater. 
Okay, next, um, I'd like to call Mr. Uh, Johnson uh, from uh, MPC, and then I uh, want to welcome Mr. Liner with your testimony, and do state your name for the record. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair Hearn, members of the committee. For the record, my name is James Lehner. I'm the policy associate from Conservation Minnesota. We represent members in all 87 counties and advocating for policies that ensure clean water, land, and air for every Minnesotan. Today, I'm here to speak in support of Senate File 4523 and the establishment of a Critical Materials Recovery Advisory Task Force. This bill would provide the Pollution Control Agency with another tool for managing the valuable minerals currently lost in our waste stream and an opportunity to create a truly circular system that puts our waste to good use. You've undoubtedly heard a lot about Minnesota's trash and waste issues this session, from reducing single-use plastics to updating our electronic recycling programs. Many of the facts that underlie, underlie those needs are relevant here, so I'll summarize. We're producing more waste than our system can manage. Our dependence on landfills and incinerators is environmentally damaging and unsustainable, and we're losing tons of valuable reusable materials in our waste stream every year. In the case of these designated critical materials, much of our electronic waste contains resources like lithium, cobalt, manganese, and zinc, which are necessary pieces to developing the wind, solar, and hydrogen technology we need to meet our clean energy goals. We currently rely heavily on the foreign extraction and importation of these minerals while sitting on a large reserve of these materials in our waste stream. This presents us with an incredible opportunity to fuel our clean energy transition through a truly circular system where the minerals we recover are put back into production to build out our renewable energy system. We can do this in a way that creates more good jobs in Minnesota and brings us closer to meeting our larger environmental targets. Through the task force proposed in this legislation, we can begin to study the methods, technologies, and infrastructure we need to close the loop on this system and develop a robust Minnesotan economy of material recovery and technology development. For those reasons, we believe Senate File 4523 is a great step to developing modern solutions to our waste issues. It addresses problems in our waste stream, provides us with resources for our clean energy development, and enables us to implement better reuse plans for these critical materials. And I'd like to thank Senator Housechild for authoring this bill and thank the committee for their time this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ms. Lindner. I'd like to call Ms. Ann Johnson to the table. And so uh, now, Mr. Johnson, Tom Johnson from MPCA, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, for the record, my name is Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, I'll keep it really brief, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is not the governor's bill, but nevertheless, uh, the MPCA is supportive of, uh, of House or, uh, Senate File uh, 4523. Uh, the improve, uh, improving recovery of critical minerals is uh, critical to ensure we're uh, meeting our climate, uh, our climate goals that are set out by the legislature and also within the climate action framework. It, it all, will also uh, minimize the environmental impacts of goods mm -hmm. and daily activities. It will uh, capture valuable materials that would otherwise have been lost, and in turn, uh, that will increase economic opportunity in the state. Um, appreciate also uh, the amendment um, from Senator Housechild uh, giving an extra six months um, on this. This will ensure uh, you know, a, a task force that is able to accomplish the, the task at hand and, and provide an actionable report to the legislature. So really appreciate that work, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to call uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Olinger to the table, and then um, Ms. Ann Johnson. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Her and committee members. My name is Anna Johnson. I'm the Senior Manager of State and Local Affairs at Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a 30-year-old Minnesota-based nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization. We work to shape and drive bold policy solutions to achieve equitable carbon-neutral economies, and we appreciate the opportunity to offer our support for Senate File 4523. Fresh Energy has been working for decades to accelerate the deployment of clean energy technologies from wind and solar to electric transportation. With the global economy now unmistakably transitioning toward clean, low, and zero carbon technologies across a broad range of applications, there's both an urgency and an opportunity to begin addressing product end-of-life issues, including and especially the recovery of materials used throughout the clean energy economy. This bill takes a pragmatic step towards addressing this emerging issue. A task force such as the one proposed would allow for broad perspectives to be heard from a diverse set of stakeholders as the state develops uh, policies and programs to address these issues. Fresh Energy also appreciates the specific direction that the task force should work to identify solutions that prevent high value reus reusable materials from being disposed of through landfilling or incineration. 
Our global energy transition is well underway and developing supply chains for reusable materials recovery uh, from clean energy products and other electronic waste is an essential strategy for ensuring that we are prepared and ready as this transition accelerates even further. For these reasons, Fresh Energy encourages members to support Senate File 4523. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for being under two minutes on your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be, being that this bill has fiscal note, I'd like to pass on to Mr. Miller. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Blindsided there. Um, before, before we go to Mr. Miller, let's, let's have Ms. Lori Olinger uh, testify first. Go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Herr and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 4523, and thank you to Senator Housechild for authoring the bill. My name is Lori Olinger, and I'm here on behalf of Sierra Club North Star Chapter. We support the establishment of a task force to enhance the recovery of critical materials from the end-of-life products. This bill represents a significant step towards advancing sustainable materials management practices in our state by fostering collaborative, uh, collaboration among diverse stakeholders. This legislation has the potential to drive meaningful progress towards a more circular and resource efficient economy. The electronic waste stream contains $2.8 billion worth of precious metals. However, only 24% of e-waste is actually recycled. Very small percentage of that is recovered here. Most is shipped internationally for industrial processing where there are worse environmental and labor standards. The North Star chapter recognizes the importance of establishing the necessary shift in our waste management to support an integrated system to collect, transport, and recycle products with these critical minerals here in Minnesota. Taking it to the next step to be able to process the recycled material would be a great opportunity in Minnesota. We see the benefit of, task force, of the task force investigating emerging technologies to be able to keep these resources in our state and create good jobs. Also, e-waste contains toxic components that are hazardous for humans and damage the environment. And keeping e-waste out of landfills, incinerators, and, and the environment and finding solutions for processing it, processing it that protects workers is very important. We appreciate that the task force will address these health and environmental justice issues. We also appreciate the, pro the provision to engage stakeholders in meaningful consultation by fostering collaboration amongst environmental advocates, community members, unions, tribal governments, and industry representatives. This legislation promotes transparency and inclusivity in decision making, which will contribute to the development of effective and equitable solutions. We appreciate your consideration and your support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Miller, on a fiscal note. <clears throat> um, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'll note that the bill as written does not have an appropriation, but there is a fiscal note that should have been included in your packet. And I'll just point to a couple of things on the fiscal note. Um, the PCA is estimating the total cost would be about $319,000. And this could come from the environmental fund, which is funded through uh, the solid waste tax. They are showing on page three of the fiscal note that there would be one contractor hired and then one other FTE um, temporary FTE at the uh, PCA to facilitate um, the task force. And then also there would be per diem for the people that are task force members. So that would, um, and based on the amendment, I'll have to look at it a little bit closer if this would require, the amendment extended the task force a little bit, and but I don't know if that will affect the price of the task force or not, and I'll work with PCA on that. So. I just want to point it out to members that this task force would have a cost. Okay, members, any questions to the testifiers or uh, on the fiscal note? On uh, uh, Senator House Chow. Okay, so no, Senator House Chow, closing remark. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. You know, I think uh, it's really special when you get a bill that is seen as a win-win-win kind of across the board. Um, we know that 
in Minnesota and in our country, we need the critical materials to meet our climate goals, um, as well as addressing our environmental concerns that we have across our country. What this bill does is it brings together a coalition that doesn't always agree on everything, but we agree that looking at how we can recycle the critical materials that we already use in our phones and our televisions and all of these technologies that we purchase in modern day, how can we make sure that we're recapturing that and circling it back into our economy and utilizing those for a green economy? So I really see this as a win-win. It's not everything. Uh, I still firmly believe that we need to get the critical materials in other ways as well, but this is one part of the puzzle, and the coalition coming together around this is a really, really powerful group uh, that I think shows that we can come together uh, in addressing the big challenges that we face. So I'm grateful for the bipartisan support. Um, when you have Senator Eichhorn, Senator McEwen, and Senator Hochschild in the Senate agreeing on a critical materials issue, that's a pretty special thing. When you have Representative Igo and Representative Kozlowski and Liz Lagarde in the House agreeing on a critical materials thing, uh, that, that's, that means it, it should be supported. So uh, I appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Senator Hochschild, for your leadership, and thank you all the testifier and stakeholders for coming together on this and the support of bipartisan, and let's make Minnesota better. So we'll lay Senate file 4523 for possible inclusion. No, oh, no, not that. Yeah, it is for possible inclusion. Next is Senator McCune, uh, Senate file 4910. Welcome, Senator McCune. Anytime you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. It's my pleasure today to present Senate File 4910. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have an A1 author's amendment that I'd like to uh, make a motion to adopt to, to get the bill in the shape that I would like for our discussion today and um, just reflect some changes that the stakeholders have made in order to make the bill a little more feasible and um, Better, I think. Okay, Senator McCune, um, motion to adapt the A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion prevail. Okay, now to the bill as amended, Senator McCune. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minnesotans understand that our climate is changing. The idea that we should prepare for that change is not controversial. In fact, we've been doing it for years at the Capitol every time we've invested in flood mitigation or wildfire preparedness or emergency planning. Those have been important investments, but they've been piecemeal. Likewise, many of the costs of adaptation and resilience are borne by local governments who are too often not in the position to do what's needed to prepare our communities for a hotter, wetter state with more extreme weather. That's why it's time that we think more comprehensively and longer term about the costs we're going to face as a state. This bill funds a study designed to quantify the projected economic costs of adapting to climate change in three potential scenarios uh, with intermediate, high, and very high greenhouse gas emissions, um, the various scenarios. These projections, or shared socioeconomic pathways, are the consensus model used to better understand the risks and impacts of climate change by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They are also projections we use when we study adaptation in Minnesota. In 2021, the legislature made a bipartisan investment in studying future weather projections in Minnesota from now until the year 2100. That model, called Minnesota Climat, uh, or Climate Mapping and Analysis Tool, is up and running now. It's a nation-leading tool that allows us to model impacts like heat and precipitation down to 2.6 square mile resolutions. It's a powerful tool for, for planning, where we plant, how we build, and what we need to protect. For example, it's allowing us to create regular analysis on projected climate impacts in agriculture. The most recent of these, titled Climate Change Impacts on Minnesota Agriculture, was published in January of this year. The study being proposed in this bill builds on these projections by adding robust economic analysis. In other words, it asks, if these are the projected impacts, what will they cost Minnesotans? 
Just a note, not all climate change impacts are as robustly modeled as heat and precipitation. For these impacts, rather than full cost estimates, the study would offer analysis of what we know and what we don't about these costs based on the best available research. I understand, Mr. Chair and members, that talking about climate change can make people nervous about the future. A study like this should help. When we understand what we're dealing with, we'll be better prepared to address it. Minnesotans can and do take on big challenges. We don't have to be afraid of our future. And with that, members, um, I will stand for questions. And I believe we have a uh, maybe some testify uh, testifier. Do we have a testifier? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. Can, can the testifier come come to uh, the, the table? Um, Ms. Aurora Balter. And why don't while well, you're situated, why don't we have Mr. Mueller? go over the fiscal note. Um, Mr. Chair and members, there was a fiscal note that was included in the packet for this bill. The bill as originally um, crafted, the original fiscal note came out with a $5 million cost, and that was based on the original timing in the bill. The DE amendment changed a number of things in the bill, and all I'll say is I'll work with the PCA to determine um, the cost of the new DE amendment, it, sh it should come down based on the timing of the, the report in the DE and some of the other factors that were in the DE amendment, but I'll have to work with PCA to get a new cost. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions so far? Senator Green? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, but was there another testifier? Or? Yes, there well, is. We can yeah. wait for a testifier to be okay. done. All right, so uh, Ms. Voltry, stay your name for the, welcome and stay your name for the record. Uh, Chair Her, members of the committee, my name is Aurora Votrin and I'm the legislative director for the 100% campaign. I want to thank Senator McEwen for her leadership on Senate File 4910. Uh, this bill funds a study that would start to quantify the cost for Minnesota to adapt to climate change. We know that Minnesotans are already experiencing the impacts of climate change and that they will get worse as the effects of our actions to address the crisis catch up with the impacts already set in motions by generations of emissions. Minnesota's future will see increasing windstorms, extreme heat, and larger, more sudden precipitation events. Thankfully, our state agencies and local governments know this to be true, and many are already making plans to address these impacts. They're looking at climate trends, risks, resilient infrastructure, prevention, and preparedness, among many others. But for us to fully adapt to make sure that no Minnesotans are left behind, we need a full picture of not just what we're facing and how to adapt to it, but how much it will cost for us to do so, to ensure that our elected leaders can plan and prioritize. Adapting to the climate crisis will be costly, but failing to adapt will cost much more. This study will enable us to be intentional and plan for those costs instead of using piecemeal and emergency funds when these impacts inevitably need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walter. Now, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the author or maybe the testifier before she takes off. Uh, first of all, um, you, in your bill on starting at uh, 1.8, it talks about shared socioeconomic pathways and representative concentration pathways. Can you tell me what those are? Senator McHugh, um, Ms. Wiltre. I think I'll, I'll defer to our expert here to talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, so I believe that this is, uh, as a non-expert, um, our experts who have been helping us draft this bill um, were unable to be here today, but I promise you that there are people who have been working on this who are much more knowledgeable than I am, um, but uh, it, ha it is a... Uh, modeling that has been uh, used by the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, and their, their team of scientists. <laughs> Senator Green? I'll, uh, maybe, let just, maybe, maybe let Senator Wiesenberg jump in on that one too, but that's, uh, um, you know, you're asking for 
uh, obviously more than $5 million here, uh, and it's kind of open-ended. It would be certainly nice to know what uh, um, the, the definition of this, because uh, my next question was going to be, uh, have they been used before, and is there any, um, any data that would show us that these, these things are, uh, that are there are workable? Because modeling is just a guess. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, thank you, Senator Green. I appreciate these questions. We'll absolutely get you the information about this. Um, I don't think that modeling is just a guess. I think it's more than that. I think more goes into modeling than a guess. And I do want to make a note for the record that I do not appreciate my colleagues laughing at the person who has come to testify on behalf of my bill. Um, that's not acceptable. So, um, but I, I will get you the information that you seek, uh, Senator Green. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator so, and I appreciate that. And I look for that information. I'd also like, uh, you know, the, the statements that were made said that uh, you're going off existing uh, data as far as the what you're going to be using to model your climate change. Uh, I would like that information as well, as, as long as you're looking it up, because I hear a lot of it, but I've never seen it. So thank you, Mr. Sarah McCune. Thank you. Your skepticism is noted. We'll get you the information. Senator Wiesenberg. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, we asked a question and we didn't receive an answer. So we're not laughing at anybody, but that's what happened. You know, we're, we're looking at money spending mid-century, late-century, end of 20th, 20th, 21st century. We're going to ask for $5 million to figure out what's happening in 76 years. What's going to happen tomorrow? We can't model with the climate for tomorrow. Like, we don't know if it's going to snow next week. So we're going to try to model the climate for 76 years from now. I'd like to have a geologist come and speak to us about Earth climate and the, the climate change that's happened through the last billion years on Earth. Like, 3% of the what's happening we can control, and the 97% of what happens on Earth we can't control. And most of it isn't even happening in Minnesota, like a very small percentage of this is happening in our state. We can't control what other countries even do, yet it's costing our economy billions of dollars. Now, do we want to hurt the environment? No, we don't. But if you're asking for money to study something that it just doesn't make sense to me at all. So we can't, we can't predict what the weather is going to be like in 76 years. We don't know what the weather is going to be like in 13 days. So thank you. Thank you for the comment, but I think Sarah McCune uh, may have better answer for you on that. And Sarah McCune, you're, 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 you're thank you, Mr. Floor. Chair. It, I appreciate that very much. And um, it's noted to me that we have colleagues among us who do not believe um, in human caused climate change, and um, that is just what it is. But we have to proceed forward. We have to protect the people of Minnesota. We have to um, take these issues seriously, uh, and um, and we will get the information that we have. There are. Um, as we know, the grand majority, almost every scientist who works on uh, climate throughout the world agrees that humans have caused a drastic, remarkable climate change that is getting worse and worse that we are already seeing happen in real time in front of us. And um, I... Uh, I want to make sure that, that we move forward and that we protect people both in terms of making sure that we have the resources to be able to make the changes that we will need to make to our infrastructure um, and just economically, but also to uh, plan, as this bill does, help us prepare for just information about what the costs are going to be. Uh, we, we're going into this in many ways sort of blind when we haven't done the calculations that we need to do to look ahead and make make good decisions. So, um, just for planning purposes, and and as to the five million dollar cost, again, I would like to reiterate, and we have heard this confirmed um, by the MPCA as well as we just heard from our fiscal analyst here in committee, um, that with the changes that we have made to the bill, uh, we are looking at a lower cost, and we can also provide that information to the committee when it's available. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator McEwen, and I agree. Um, so, I was a good, good, good closing, good comment as well. So we're just uh, go, going to go ahead and uh, lay over um, Senate File 4910 for possible inclusion in an omnibus budget bill. Thank you, Senator McHugh. Thank you.
Next is Senate Kunish, Senate File 5162. Or you got two bill back to back. You can either one. Senator Kunish, welcome. Thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Chair. I ha I'll start off with the A1 amendment, please. And this simply um, inserts $750,000 as the um, cost to this bill and um, changes a little bit of the language. Okay, Senator Kunish moved uh, to, for us to adopt the A1 amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion prevail. Senator McCune to the bill. As amended. Senator Kunish. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay. um, members, Kunish. I'd like to give you a little bit of um, history to, in context of this uh, Senate file 5162. Um, the piece of land that we're talking about are sections 16 and 36, um, excuse me, that's not correct. Uh, this is a little bit of information about the school trust lands. So section 16 and 36 of every township in Minnesota was reserved for the use of schools in the Minnesota Enabling Act. Minnesota received 2.9 million acres of school trust lands through this federal grant, including the 18 acre parcel that is the subject of this bill. This 18 acre school trust parcel is in lieu of uh, in lieu selection or indemnity selection. And indemnity school trust lands are school trust lands that the federal government conveyed to Minnesota for the acreage of sections 16 and 36 and were within a tribal reservation boundary that had already been conveyed or were underwater. The state land office sold this 18 acre parcel in 1896 via certificate of sale or contract for deed. The buyer then failed to complete the terms of the sale and the state canceled the sale in 1936 and the 18 acre parcel reverted to the school trust land status per Minnesota land. If we go back um, a little bit in history um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Nelson Act of 1889 that attempted to remove all of the Anishinaabe in the Minnesota, in Minnesota to the white earth. Then in 1914 and again in the 1920s, numerous attempts were made to dispossess Mille Lacs tribal members from their lands by the Mille Lacs County Sheriff, whose posse then burned the dwellings of tribal villages in several areas around Mille Lacs Lake, including the areas of Cove and South Harbor Township. This is the area where the disputed parcel of land is located that we are here to discuss today. This 18 acre parcel has uh, come to be known as Peewash property, and it is a his has a history filled with both trauma and perseverance. Mille Lacs tribal members and their ancestors have lived on this parcel of land for more than 200 years. But it was Melvin Peewash who occupied the land when the trespass order was issued by the state DNR 20 plus years ago. And that was the start of the journey that has brought us here today. After many, many hours of in-person meetings, email exchanges, and most recently Zoom meetings, we finally arrived at a resolution that benefits everybody. The bill before you allows the Commissioner of Natural Resources to condemn this land in Mille Lacs County and convey the land to the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe with the most of the proceeds of this conveyance going back to reimburse the school trust lands. This transfer has been collaborative. It's been worked on with the DNR, the Office of School Trust Lands and the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and in effort to finally resolve this longstanding issue. So, Mr. Chair and members at this time, um, I have a couple of testifiers, if um, you would be so kind. Okay. And testify may proceed. Mr. Edwards? Uh, yes. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, I think Senator Kunish 
uh, actually shared the majority of the background on, on this particular issue. I'm the Special Advisor of Government Affairs for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and I'm here in support of uh, Senate File 5162 today. It's a bill directing the Commissioner of Natural Resources to condemn land in Mille Lacs County and convey that land to the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Uh, it is, as, as uh, the Senator noted, uh, the history of this parcel goes back uh, many years. Uh, and this topic, it's a sad part of our shared history, uh, but is a reality for tribal, many tribal nations, including the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. It's been more than 20 years since we first started negotiations with the state DNR to reclaim this disputed parcel, and we're happy to have reached a, an agreement that we consider a win-win for, uh, for both parties. So Chimigwich, Senator Hare, um, her, and uh, members of the committee uh, for hearing this important bill today. Thank you. So welcome, Mr. Lindy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Aaron Vandalin, School Trust Lands Director, and I uh, will not bore you with the, the history. You've already heard it a couple of times, so uh, appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, I'll just speak to the school trust interest here. Um, you know, the senator talked earlier about the parcel being sold and then forfeiting and then coming back. The, it's been available for management since 1936. The school trust has received no revenue from the parcel since 1936. I would submit to the committee that the only option to generate revenue on this parcel is to divest of it. And I believe that the uh, amendment, and thank you, uh, Senator, for the amendment, um, I believe the amendment will cover not only the transactional cost, but the condemnation award based on uh, some research. So again, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of uh, Senate File 5162. And again, thank you, Senator Kunish, for your leadership on the Permanent School Fund Commission. Uh, we have a number of these issues that we need to address throughout the state. This just happens to be the one that's in front of us today. And I'll stand for questions. Okay, thank you. And I know the DNR is here with us too. Um, us, Deputy Commissioner, do you want to make a statement since uh, there's what I would say peace in the valley <laughs> yeah. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, members, sure. for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. I was just trying to save you some time. Uh, yes, we have been working, as uh, Tess Fires have stated, with the Mille Lacs Band and the Office of School Trust Lands, and thank uh, Senator Kunish for bringing this forward, hopefully for final resolution. Okay. Question from members? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like there's a savings. Does that go to the, from Mr. Vandalin, does that go to the corpus then? Does this, does that... You're shaking your head. I, yeah, I already know the answer, but I just want him to say it anyway. Mr. Vandalin. Uh, Chair, Herb, members, and Senator Hoffman, uh, yes, the, uh, any proceeds from a sale go directly to the Permanent School Fund corpus. It's a win-win. Mm -hmm. That's like and the, a win. the last person to do a school, a, 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 a thing like this for our school trust lands and making sure, you know, things were in balance was Carrie Rood. Man, this was, you know, when got to be seven years ago and I think this is a uh, don't date me on that but um, this is nice I, I this is very good nice job with this and mr. Edwards good to see you um, so thank you mr. chair I didn't realize that this was uh, the upside of that so very good yeah maybe this could be a model for us to wow. move forward on uh, on other you know land back negotiation as long so. as it doesn't take 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so any question from members? Uh, Senator Kunish, closing remark? you know how much money that is? Uh, no, but I just appreciate you listening and learning and understanding the significance of this transaction and really appreciate uh, the support that you might give it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, now we'll lay uh, Senate file 5162 for possible inclusion in the supplement budget on a bus bill. Next is Senate file 4250, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Hoffman. You're going to like this one also. Um, the Senate file 4250 requires the school trust land director 
sitting next to me, uh, to study the recreational use of the school trust lands to determine the amount of money to be allocated to the permanent school fund from fees paid to the state for outdoor recreation purposes. This bill was developed to address a recommendation made by the 2020 OLA report on the school trust land management and oversight. It is essential that the DNR develops a comprehensive set of measures to help assess the management of the school trust lands and the, the revenue that it generates. This report would help the legislature create policies to accurately compensate the trust for the recreational activities that take place on the lands. So a lot of the um, uh, school trust lands located across Minnesota are on lands that even either generate um, licensure for hunting or fishing or ATV, but uh, we're not sure that those funds are getting um, in the full amount to those school, to the um, school trust to their kids here in Minnesota, and so we'd like to find out what the, what's happening and how we can make sure that we're increasing those dollars that are going to our students. Thank you, Senator Quinnish. Um, we have two testify, one on remote and the other is here, um, right next to you, Mr. Van Lindy. And uh, we're also going to have uh, Mr. Miller uh, talk about the fiscal notes. Uh, it's, just, it's just been passed to you, members, right now. So uh, let's hear from Mr. Van, Van, Del, Van Del Lind, uh, Welcome again and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, again, Aaron Vandalin, School Trust Lands Director, and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak in favor of Senate File 4250. And as always, uh, Senator Kunesh, thank you again for keeping this issue uh, in front of the legislature. Uh, and just a brief history on school trust land management over the last decade, Mr. Chair. Uh, in 2012, the legislature passed a law that required the state to compensate the permanent school fund for policies and designations that prohibit revenue generation. That's Minnesota Statute 84 subdivision, or excuse me, 84027 subdivision 18B through C. Um, after that law was passed, we did an inventory and we identified all of the lands that required compensation and came up with a value estimate. That value estimate was $85 million. In 2016, 2018, the Office of School Trust Land worked with the DNR to further hone in on that value. We did two different reports. Um, the values stayed about the same. We're still in the 75 to $85 million range that is owed to the trust. Uh, there's been numerous attempts to request compensation. We have received no compensation to date. Uh, Senator Kunesh mentioned the OLA report from 2020. That was a special review done by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. And I just want to point out one recommendation to you, and that's the second recommendation from the Office of Legislative Auditor. And I quote, it says, consistent with state law, the legislature should compensate the permanent school fund for instances in which state policies or legislative actions have prohibited school trust lands from generating revenue. Again, it's been over 10 years the school trust has not received any compensation under this law. Um, this proposal and this bill would actually advance one aspect of that compensation requirement in, subdivision, or in Minnesota Statute 84027. Um, the school trust does currently receive a modicum um, amount of revenue from recreation opportunities, forest campgrounds, uh, superior biking trail, um, the Tioga mountain bike uh, site in Cohasset, uh, just to name a couple of exam examples, uh, the biggest issue that we're facing and the, the biggest dollar amount that we're facing for the compensation is the 207 water public water access sites that are on Minnesota, lakes and rivers that are school trust sites. Um, it's 41,000 lineal front feet on lakes and rivers. It's roughly 1,100 acres. Um, so that is... Um, and you know, I think this task force that would set up a um, very short time frame, uh, but we can get it done if we're allowed to contract for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van, Van Linde. Um, we have an online testifier uh, who can join us right now. So Ms. Dizzy Dietrich or 
Representative Dietrich, welcome. It's been a while. Yes, it has. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Denise Dietrich, and I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota School Boards Association. We represent the state's 331 school boards. I am testifying here in support of Senator Kunish's bill, Senate File 4250, that directs the school trust lines director to study and issue a report on the recreational use of school trust lands in Minnesota. We know that Minnesotans are active in the outdoors in many different ways, boating, hunting, fishing, ATVing, biking, snowmobiling, uh, snowmobiling maybe not so much this year, but many of these activities are done on school trust lands. Yet the beneficiaries of the school trust lands, in other words, our students, do not see the full potential for revenue from those lands that we as Minnesotans use every day, every season. So as such, this study can provide more information on where these rec recreational activities are occurring and where the school trust, land, school trust lands should be compensated for the use of, the land, of their lands that are held in trust for the beneficiaries. In other words, as I just mentioned, the students in Minnesota. So in your role as trustees as the permanent school fund, this information outlined in this bill would be a crucial first step for you to eventually and fairly compensate the trust. Another advantage to identifying where these activities would, are occurring is that we can begin to uh, part, start putting signage up on these recreational pieces of property to help educate all Minnesotans and students on school trust lands and their value and how they generate revenue to contribute to their public education. So in any discussion on the issue of school trust lands, I like to remind the legislators that when you make a decision involving the trust, you are acting as a trustee. So I always like to remind us some of the duties of a trustee. It is undivided loyalty to the trust, make the trust assets productive, and to generate income, and to keep and render accounts. This report is, is what is needed in order to assist you in fulfilling your role as a trustee. So we urge you to support and pass this bill so that the beneficiaries, our students, receive the full benefits of being trust fund babies. With that, I will conclude my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Dietrich, I represent Dietrich um, for your uh, testimony. I would now go to Mr. Mueller to get us a run through of the fiscal note. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There was a fiscal note passed out um, for this bill, Senate File 4250. Um, the fiscal note estimates a cost of $417,000. Um, the fiscal note identifies the permanent school fund as paying for the cost of the study. The appropriation would actually come from something called the forest, forest suspense account, and is actually how we pay for the Office of School Trust um, and the director's salary. So it would be funded similar to that. The fiscal note on page two estimates a cost of $250,000 for an independent contractor to work on these uh, estimations. Uh, $50,000 to undertake a survey because some of the developing some of these estimations will require an on-site survey uh, for some of these activities and then um, additional $67,000 for a, a half FTE and then $50,000 to contract with DNR to do more study of a data analysis. I will point out that this will just produce a report and a future legislature would have to sort of digest that report and then use any of the uh, results of this report to estimate if you know additional money from uh, hunting fees, fishing fees and things like that will go into the school trust instead of into you know the game and fish fund. I would look at it similar to how we currently get gas tax that goes to um, ATV accounts and snowmobile accounts. 
is where we put a, a really small percentage into statute and say that a certain amount of that money, you know, generated by the gas tax goes into these accounts. And this would sort of be similar with the school trust land. This report would develop a very small percentage probably, you know, of, of fishing or boating or something like that. And then each year, a, a small percentage of the boat fees or snowmobile fees and things like that would go into the school trust if directed by the legislature. So this doesn't automatically result in the money going into the school trust, but the legislature would have to enact that. Okay. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that explanation. It's nice to see Denise Dietrich, who, when you look at um, when this school trust land director position was created, it was really Denise's advocacy on making sure that, because the money in the corpus, corpus trust actually go, it benefits the youth, right? And, and I just looked at $417,000 in, in the Anoka Independent know, School District, that's $10 per pupil unit that we just added to the to the corpus, and not that I'm a finance person, but it's so good to see that because it's really, when you look at it collectively, it really does a, a service into not only do one thing of making sure that the trust keeps the money, but there's also some education that goes on there. And and having that, you know, Senator Kunish is actually the co-chair chair, I think it's the chair of the house this year of that. Are we gonna have a, we're gonna have a meeting soon? I mean, this is really good. It just reminds me how much I, I, I miss the, conversation of the school trust lands and it's just so nice to see this kind of work being done in the environmental bill so um, kudos to that it would be nice to bring the team back together and have a conversation is that something you're going to do in the future senator kunish uh, we're hoping to uh, senator or excuse me Senator Representative uh, Newton is the chair and I am the co-chair and we've been trying to find a good time to to get us all together like you said and just have a good discussion and reminder of how important it is that we are using those lands to generate the maximum amount of money for our students. So we're hoping to um, stay tuned and, and we'll see what we can do to get that one together. And, and thank you. And Mr. Chair, if I may, just as a follow-up that, you know, other states have not done what we've done in Minnesota. I mean, there's a neighboring state. They, they put their land up and they sold it and they don't benefit on the focus of the of the youth or the child and there isn't that trust account you know like that hence that you should have brought the the little sheets of trust fund you have a trust fund child in Minnesota Mr. Vandal and that was one of the most brilliant marketing or or design things I've seen in a while but I mean what we're doing is right what Mr. Vandaland is doing is right um, for the for the school districts the students in Minnesota and it's just so nice to see that back in this conversation because it's been a while so thank you Thank you. Any Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. To uh, the testifier, uh, Mr. Vandalin, um, this is a noble task here, and, um, and you're, you're going to have to complete this by January, next January. First question is, do you think that that's enough time to get this done? Uh, Senator, Mr. Vandalin. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, and members, uh, Yes, I believe we can get it done if we can contract for it. Um, we have a very small office. There are two and a half people in our office, including myself. We are actually working on a statutorily required 25-year management plan that uh, eats up most of our time. So that is the reason why we would need to contract for it. Mr. Chair. Senator Green. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I know we, you and I have talked in the past on uh, school trust land and how important it is to keep that... Uh, school trust land uh, in trust instead of selling it. I know in the past, well, just now we have voted to, to sell some, and I guess I understand it if you're not going to get any revenue off of it, but uh, the land is always there. The money isn't always worth what it should be worth, so it's nice to see that happen. But just one more question. Have you, have you been in contact uh, with the DNR on this as far as working together, and, and do, they, do they foresee uh, fees or, or uh, licenses going up because of this? Senator, Mr. Valendi. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, members, uh, I have uh, discussed it with, with DNR. We have not got into the details of whether or not voter registration fees or hunting fees would go up. That That is the results that we would get from this report of what okay. the estimates would be, I think. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any further discussion? Senator Kunish, closing remark. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is just a, a really important goal of mine to um, get the school trust lands generating the maximum amount of dollars. And we do have uh, uh, other projects in mind and, and in the works to address the school trust lands. And as I said, to get those, those dollars to our students, uh, we know that our schools are hurting in a lot of different ways. And if we can find these, these um, areas of revenue and opportunity to not only increase that corpus, but also to get those dollars into the, the schools and into um, our educational process, then it'll be a huge success. Thank you, uh, Senator, Senator Kunish. So now we will lay over Senate File 4250 for possible inclusion. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, next is Senator Hauchow. We have about 20 minutes. Do you think you can, we can manage? All right. Okay. Now I just want, as you make your way there, I just want to announce again because we had a line of uh, testifier. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six total. Uh, and so we're going to stick with the two minute rules again. So, uh, Senator Hauchow, looks like you have an author amendment. A2 I do, amendment. Mr. Chair, okay. uh, the A2, yes. Okay. Do you want us to move that? Yes, please. Okay. All right, All we right. move how Charles, uh, the A2 amendment. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion prevail. And we do have fiscal note. Uh, maybe, no? No fiscal note no, for this one? Okay. Um, Sir, how Charles, on to the bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Environment Committee. Um, today I have for your consideration Senate File 5048, a bill regarding the mining of non-petroleum gas, such as hydrogen and helium. I was going to bring a helium balloon with me and talk in a funny voice today just to start, but I decided to, to uh, leave that out of this. But, um, you know, my district, northern Minnesota, um, is, is rich in history of providing many of the minerals, the timber and some of the most beautiful places we have in Minnesota. Um, Northern Minnesota is really a gem, I think, uh, for many of the best things that Minnesota provides, both our state and the rest of the country. Um, and now we have another exciting opportunity in Northern Minnesota because we have found a gas pocket of helium in Lake County along the North Shore. Um, Minnesota has untapped uh, potential when it comes to hydrogen and helium resources. The exploration site in Lake County that I just referred to contains somewhere between 12 and 14 percent helium, which is uh, some of the highest in the entire world. With no history of gas or oil production in the state, Minnesota lacks a framework that would support these emergent industries and properly conserve natural resources, protect human health, and develop a fair royalty structure on our state lands with regards to gas. This bill proposes um, to a, ex, excuse me proposes amendments to existing statutes and new laws that would protect the ongoing discovery drilling that is occurring in our region, allow for temporary permits for the commercialization of helium production, and support the creation of a rulemaking process to facilitate long-term helium exploration. Upon enactment, it would allow the DNR to lease land for these purposes, strengthening the local communities by providing both royalty disbursements and rental payments to local cities, school districts, and counties. It would also temporarily prohibit the commercial extraction of gas on lands in Minnesota until an interim permitting authority is authorized. Without this legislation, the truth is that gas exploration and extraction will proceed. Uh, however, it will not happen with the benefits to our communities, and it won't happen with proper o oversight from our state government. So with that, Mr. Chair, as you mentioned, I do have several testifiers, including um, a local commissioner from Lake County who I'm excited to have with me today um, and would be happy to answer any questions after the testimony or before, however you would like. Okay. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to go according to the list here. First is uh, Mr. Joe Henderson, and then followed by Steve uh, Siva. <coughs> and then follow after that would be uh, Sarah Mor Moradin, and then uh, Mr. Van, Van der Leiden again, and then uh, Mr. Clement. 
Uh, so welcome, Mr. Henderson. State your name for the record. Good afternoon, Chair, committee members. My name is Joe Henderson. I'm the director for the Lands and Minerals Division at the DNR. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today on the helium, hydrogen, and sequestration bill. Um, I will try not to repeat too much of uh, what Senator Housechild said, but I think there are a few things that uh, merit um, a repeat. So why now? You know, as Senator said, you know, currently in Lake County, there's a 40-acre parcel of private land where helium was recently discovered. The parcel surrounded on three sides by tax-forfeited lands. Without legislation allowing the leasing and requiring pooling agreements, the county, local township, and schools won't receive revenue from the royalty or rental payments tied to leasing for petroleum gas production or benefit from pooling agreements that would protect adjacent landowners from having gas drawn from under their property with no compensation. The company that drilled the helium appraisal well in northeastern Minnesota envisions a potential production level of 11,000 gallons of liquid helium per day, which is currently worth approximately a million dollars a day. Why hydrogen? Hydrogen exploration companies have identified drilling targets for geologic hydrogen in Nebraska and Kansas along a geologic formation known as the Mid-Continent Rift. This formation extends northward into Minnesota from the Iowa border to Lake Superior. The United States Geological Survey considers the Mid-Continent Rift to be one of the top two prospective regions for geologic hydrogen production in the United States. Exploration is moving north. One of our geologists noted today that this Senate building sits about dead center within the Mid-Continent Rift. Federal money is being made available for exploration for naturally occurring hydrogen. In February 22nd of this year, the U.S. Department of Energy announced 16 projects across eight states that would receive $20 million each to accelerate the production of naturally occurring geologic hydrogen. So what does this bill do? As the Senator mentioned, plus a few more, uh, the bill proposes to amend DNR's existing oil and gas authority to include non-petroleum gases and directs the state agencies to evaluate the need for new rules that would support a regulatory framework for the, for the exploration and production of gas and oil resources in the state. Upon enactment, the bill would immediately allow the DNR to lease state managed lands to prospect for non-petroleum gas resources. This would allow both royalty disbursements and rental payments to state and local governments under Minnesota Statute 9322. Funding would be provided through this bill to hire staff and consultants who would help write rules for leasing, permitting, and associated activities for this emerging industry. Thank A you. Technically Thank advisory. you, Mr. Henderson. I, I know. Uh, Unless we want to go over time, try to limit to, 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 to that's fine. testimony Thank you. to two minutes. Thank you. Um, I, will, I will stand for questions. Um, it also, maybe one of the last things I will say is, is that also the legislation would allow or require a report on geologic carbon sequestration to guide future decisions and legislation. That report would be due next year. Thank it you. would recommend statutory and policy changes. Thank you very much. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, Steve. Um, to state your name for the record. Yeah, good afternoon, my, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Rich Svey, and I'm chair of the Lake County Board of Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee, and also thank you, Senator Hochschild, for authoring the bill. I have prepared comments I wish to present. First, and as I'm sure this committee knows, Lake County is a forested county, rich in public lands and waters. We realize and understand the importance of protecting the environment, as well as the need to make sound decisions surrounding safe gas extraction. This is of paramount importance to Lake County. We also never imagined being the face of helium discovery. Lake County has been engaged on this issue of gas extraction with the Minnesota DNR and the company Pulsar for over a year. Lake County is excited about the prospect of helium, of the helium source and all of the beneficial uses that could help our region and state. Early in this process, Lake County had assumed we would be the only government entity to permit helium extraction. We were prepared to work with the DNR, MPCA, and other state agencies to make sure it was done safely and correctly. At the discovery site, the current helium well is surrounded on three sides by tax forfeit mineral and non-registered -mineral, non mineral estates. It is a fair position to state that the mineral owners, where helium or other gases are extracted, should be compensated for this extraction. Yet, 
Lake County is concerned about the potential revenue loss of our schools, local governments, and, and state for a resource that may be within our respective mineral estates. The rules outlined in Senate File 5048 need to be implemented to make sure that mineral estates, along with the school trust, and others adequately compensate for any gas extraction within their boundaries. Lake County believes this to be a fairness issue to those mineral state holders. Failure to move forward in this process would leave those mineral states vulnerable to the rule of capture. Lake County supports expedited rulemaking. We support the process to bring temporary permit rule language for helium back for action at the legislative session, at the next legis legislative session. Also, that leasing would be effective immediately when this legislation were to be implemented, as well as ensuring to have a plan in place for royalties and pooling. In summary, Lake County supports Senate File 5048. We for look forward to implementation of these rules and permitting. We will continue to work with state agencies, stakeholders, and the company or companies for safe and environmentally sound production of these gases. Thank Lake you. Lake County asks you for the committee to support Senate File 5048. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you, Commissioner Safe. Next will be uh, Ms. Sarah Morandian. And then followed by Mr. Valendi. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you, Chair, her committee members. My name is Sarah Meridian, and I'm the Government Relations and Policy Director for CURE, which is a uh, rurally based nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and restoring resilient towns and landscapes by harnessing the power of the people who care about them. We strongly opposed the portion of this bill that would have opened state lands to carbon sequestration proposed by private companies for private gain. Uh, Minnesota has no experience with geologic carbon sequestration. We do not know whether geologic sequestration is physically possible in the state, how to monitor or assess its, assess its effectiveness, if any, nor have we identified or taken an in-depth look at what the risks to environmental and human health may be. That's why we are glad to see uh, the A2 amendment, which removes those portions of the bill and replaces them with uh, a report. We do have a couple additional recommendations that we believe are necessary to ensure uh, a robust and successful report, though. Um, first, tribes should be given the opportunity to be represented on the Technical Advisory Committee instead of um, only being able to engage as non-governmental stakeholders. Um, we would also recommend that the list of subject matter expertise include tribal and treaty law and other types of carbon capture technology, not just direct air capture. Beyond the provisions about geologic sequestration of carbon dioxide, uh, we have remaining concerns about how the bill addresses new gas exploration and extraction. Um, while we understand and support the need of reg for regulation of these emerging industries, we believe that the discussion must be grounded in transparency and sound information about the potential risks and benefits so that Minnesotans can decide whether we want to host such industries. Uh, finally, if the bill moves forward or if it comes back in future years, we would urge that the agency be fully funded to do rulemaking and permitting correctly in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mor Morandum. Uh, welcome back, Ms. Vandalin. Thank you, Chair Her and members. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of uh, Senate File uh, 5048. And uh, Senator Housechild, thank you for your work on this bill and your work in the Permanent School Fund Commission. Um, members, over the last hundred years, Minnesota has protected its mineral rights by reserving and creating and severing the mineral estate from the surface estate when we've sold it. Um, before that, Minnesota conveyed over 5 million acres of its mineral rights in southern and western Minnesota. The 3.5 million acres of school trust mineral rights that remain are in 10 northern counties, and those mineral rights account for 80% of the school trust fund corpus. Corpus is worth about a billion dollars. The actual current value is $1.8 billion, if you actually look at the corpus, it's closer to a billion, so $800 million has come from mineral leasing and royalties. The issue with that is it comes from one source, and that's U.S. Steel's Mintac mine. When you're running an endowment, you do not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, we've identified this as an issue in the asset management plan. I mentioned in previous testimony that we were working on a statutorily required report. That's a 25-year management framework for school trust lands. 
We're calling it the asset management plan. We just issued phase one of that plan last year. The contractor that was working on it with us actually identified three issues that we needed to work on. One was to diversify our mineral revenues. This bill does exactly that. It gives us a new source of mineral revenue. We should not be ashamed of Minnesota's mineral wealth. Um, and we need to take full advantage of it as we try to decarbonize our economy. That was one of the other recommendations from our contractor, is to look at these opportunities to decarbonize. I think this bill does that in a number of different ways with helium production and with the opportunity to at least study geologic sequestration. And that is not my phone. Um, the, um, it's closing time, that's it. Yes, it's closing time. <laughs> I, I will wrap up. The, uh, Mr. Chair and members, the Office of School Trust Land supports the moratorium on issuing a permit. Uh, we'd be more than willing to serve on any task force that would be developing the geologic sequestration. Uh, it is, from the research that I've done, entirely different than the geologic storage that is happening in Texas and North Dakota. Um, <coughs> with that, Mr. Chair, I would, I would conclude my testimony and just ask you to support the bill. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And welcome, Mr. Mr. Clems. Uh, you. State your name for the record. Chair, her, members of the committee, my name is Aaron Clems. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, or MCEA. And I'm here to testify in favor of SF 5048 today, particularly the core of this bill, which is giving the DNR and other agencies the authority to regulate the nascent helium exploration and extraction that is emerging in northeastern Minnesota. I do want to start by just saying it's important not to oversell these possibilities. We have a long history of uh, resource extraction proposals in northeastern Minnesota that were that seemed too good to be true upon proposal and ended up being exactly that. However, given that, there is also a lot of potential here, and the early returns suggest that there's a need for state involvement and regulation of this industry, and that's why I support the core of this bill. I want to acknowledge and thank Senator Hofschild for the amendment that was just adopted that narrows the scope of this bill as introduced, particularly on the su subject of carbon sequestration and the rulemaking around that. While this is an important issue, it does not have the same urgency as the remainder of the bill, and there are a lot of uncertainties that need to be addressed, including how we're going to get CO2 to locations for sequestration, which is being evaluated by the Public Utilities Commission in separate proceedings at this time. The replacement of the rulemaking with the stakeholder group to make legislative recommendations is appropriate and will allow for more complete consideration and engagement with other stakeholders. I will say that language that seems to really open Minnesota up to oil and methane gas exploration can and should be tightened in this bill. I think everyone agrees that the point of this bill is to give the state authority to regulate this nascent non-fuel gas industry. The way that the bill is written implies a, a, a lot more latitude in terms of exploring for oil and gas. And it should be noted that Minnesota doesn't really have the geology for this. I'm not aware of any, uh, any emerging commercial interests in extracting methane gas or oil. And so I feel like we could probably do a better job of trimming this bill and being more targeted at the actual industry that's intended to be regulated here. Lastly, I just want to argue that if we're going to do expedited rulemaking, we should allow for public more, more public input. Particularly, you could include the provision in, um, in the expedited rulemaking that would allow for a public hearing if more than 50 people request it. That's Minnesota Statutes 14.389, subdivision 5. It has to be specifically added to this bill for that to occur, and I'd be happy to work with the author to try to include that if that is what folks would like to do. Um, I have some other thoughts that I'd be happy to share with the author and others, but I just wanted to conclude by saying that I appreciate the chance to testify on this bill and look forward to working with the author and others on trying to improve it. Any question from members? Uh, Sarah Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Housechild. Um, just a couple of questions about, you know, here we are, we've got a new thing to extract from the ground. Um, this feels like an opportunity to do it really well if we're going to do it. Um, someone mentioned a million dollars a day. Uh, I'd be curious to know how that million dollars a day would be dispersed. Um, I would love to see, when we're talking about extracting things from the ground in our Minnesota, the C-suite of whatever company, and I'd love to hear if there is a specific company who has come forward to say, hey, we'd love to be the ones to extract this helium. 
Um, I'd like to see them pay uh, Minnesota income taxes. I'd like to see the executives in those companies live in Minnesota, live in the communities and pay taxes here. We haven't required that in the past and I think that that's a reasonable expectation when we're talking about extracting um, precious uh, commodities from our ground. Um, I guess I'll stop there. But I agree with, I would really love to see the language tightened up with oil and gas feels very expansive. Any, any answer to, to that, um, Mr. Henderson? Yeah, I think the, to the question about the disbursement, I think we'll go to Mr. Henderson. And, and Mr. Chair. Sarah Morrison. And uh, if there is a specific company that has come oh, forward, I would love to know that too. Mr. Chair, Senator Morrison, Pulsar is the name of the company. In, in particular, in the for the helium. Yep. So, Mr. Henderson and Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, Minnesota Statute 93.22 is where we're referencing as to how royalties, rentals, or pooling agreement royalties would be distributed. It's the same statute we have been using for some time now for other minerals. Um, so, in in this instance, you know, 20% would go to the mineral management account and the remaining 80% for these tax forfeited properties, if we wanna talk about the three properties that are surrounding, um, that would go to the local school district, the city, and the county. Sarah Morrison, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you for that answer. Um, I, I'm gonna perseverate on requiring the executives to live in Minnesota. <laughs> I asked this question when we visited Talon too. None of them live in our state and they are going to become very wealthy off the minerals from our, our land. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, Senator, House Senator House. Morrison, uh, certainly, certainly applaud the, the, the sentiment. Um, I would just say that you could make the case for any of our industries in Minnesota that C-suites should be required to live in Minnesota. And, and he, uh, Sarah Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, mean, I love that conversation. You know what Thomas Sony did years ago? It was Minnesota made. He made damn sure that everybody was here in Minnesota. It was just beautiful. I just love that, that where that conversation goes. But to that point, um, school trust land, once again, it's like, all right, this is such an exciting time to have this conversation. If it's done right, and you mentioned the 2080 thing, um, is the, uh, how, do we know how much potential school trust land land there is and what the potential percentage would be on the taxation for the, the corpus? You'd mentioned it goes to the local, but you didn't mention the school trust. Is any of this stuff on the school trust, and I, I just kind of like would, to know on that one, so thank you. Senator House Child, Mr. Henderson, or Mr. Vandalin yeah. on school trust land? Would that be better? We, we can. Mr. If, Henderson. If I may, and Aaron, you can chime in too. Uh, so the company, Pulsar, right now is doing a feasibility study. That feasibility study is exactly that. They have one point, a single well. So. They're using uh, any and all tools available to understand how large that underground void could be and how it could extend into properties right now that they don't control beyond the 40 acres that they have. There is school trust land, and, and uh, Mr. Vandalin can, can comment on that, within like a quarter mile or less. Um, we already do have leases um, and requests that are being brought to us since this discovery for people that want to, of course, um, look at public lands adjacent to and, and near this property. Those do include school trust lands. The royalty, rental, and, and or pooling agreements that would be negotiated for those trust lands would be 20% mineral management, 80% school trust or university trust. Uh, Mr. Thank you, I thank you for that, the process side of it. I guess, can you explain then, Aaron, what, I mean, when we're looking at all this, what, what does that mean for our local school districts and the children that we're supposed to be incorporating this trust to. Mr. Van Linden. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman and members, uh, I cannot put a dollar amount on that at this time because we do not know how big their reservoir is. The, the purpose of this bill is actually, as I started, to protect the state's mineral interest with the moratorium. It allows us to do some leasing and it puts a moratorium in place before we get to any permitting. 
And the reason that's important is because, and I, I'm not an oil and gas expert, but I have a lot of friends in the National Association of State Trust Lands that are, and they were waiting on my call for this because they knew about this discovery. So I've talked to North Dakota, I've talked to Texas, I've talked to Montana. Resoundingly, they said, you cannot lease this the way the bill was originally written. Thank you for the amendments and the work on that, by the way, Senator. And you can't do this unless you know the unitization and pooling agreement. So what happens is when Pulsar will, you know, they start exploring or they develop it, let's think of it as a straw, right, in a bowl. They're going to put a straw in and they're going to suck out all of the helium. The helium doesn't care about our property boundaries. The helium is just going to go. And as Commissioner Space talked about earlier, the rule of capture goes to the mineral discoverer. So if Pulsar does not have leases on tax forfeited land, non-registered severed minerals, or school trust within a three mile radius, they can extract all of that resource and the state will get nothing, nothing. So it is very important that we have a moratorium, that we get to pooling agreements, so we understand the unitization. Um, it could be significant dollars, but we don't know. We don't know that the reservoir goes onto our land. We don't know that it stops at their 40-acre boundary. Mm -hmm. But geologic formations couldn't care less about where our property boundaries are. Any follow-up? So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other further question? Uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this is for Joel, perhaps. So we were talking about carbon sequestration and not just putting, we're not just putting it into holes in the ground. I believe we have like an all olivine structure and we're putting this in there and it produces hydrogen. Is that correct? So we, we're getting some kind of benefit from it or am I wrong in that? Go ahead. Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator, that is correct. We have studies that are ongoing in the state of Minnesota right now with samples of drill core um, actually extracted from, you know, within the earth. And you are correct. Um, they have discovered large bodies of, of olivine. Think of a fine dust uh, like your sands in Hawaii, right, of olivine. Um, what is being um, studied is that when uh, olivine is uh, is you know, put in contact with CO2 and, and carbon, um, it adheres to the carbon and actually there may be a byproduct of hydrogen. So you get the possibility of actually injecting CO2 gases into the olivine deposit, into the interstitial space, and having hydrogen as a byproduct of that reaction. And as was said by multiple people earlier, different than uh, North Dakota or Texas where they pump it into old natural gas wells and, and make sure it doesn't pop up somewhere else. This is actually a chemical reaction that sequesters the carbon on the olivine. Oh, Sorry, we some thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. So, yeah, right, so then we're putting it in there and it's not going anywhere and we're getting a, a good byproduct that's safe and we can make money from that too. Right. Thank you. Further question, members? All right, this bill do have a route uh, going to stay in local government, and uh, I do want to express my my um, my view on this a little bit. I support the idea Minnesota made, and like Senator Hoffman say, and Senator Morrison say, you know, if we can uh, maintain it here, the 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 the, the better it is. But is this bill in itself going to be traveled to state and local government? And I know that there's testifier here that will uh, making recommendation, and perhaps by then um, recommendation may be um, at that's that's up to you. But it's going to state and local government. So, um, any question on that front? Okay. So, um, Senator How shall move? that uh, Senate File 5048 uh, be, as amended, be referred to sta uh, Senate State Local Government Committee as, oh, I did say as amended. So all in favor, say aye. 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 
Um, Oppose? Okay, motion prevail. Congratulations. Okay, that's, this, is, uh, this is it for our um, agenda today. Uh, we'll have more Tuesday and we'll be posted online and hopefully we'll hear Senator Wiesenberg bill on Loon and Eagle study. But we'll, we'll see about, we'll have to rearrange. Okay, um, with that I will adjourn our committee today on environment, climate, and legacy. Thank you.